But some of the deepest and most painful injuries, sickness and wounds that we will receive are not physical, but mental, emotional and spiritual. Proverbs chapter 4, and we'll start at verse 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them. And listen this, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. I've called this message this morning, Healing is the Children's Bread. Healing is the Children's Bread. I want to share a story with you which happened to me about a month ago. Um, of course, some of you know in, in the summer I got, um, I really hurt my two of my fingers that I was playing basketball um, with Daniel and I stubbed my finger what do you call it here jammed it I jammed the finger and the pain was constant like it, it, it never let up I don't know whether you've ever jammed your finger but it, it was it just kind of there was just a constant it was just constantly sore and every time I shook somebody's hand it just got even worse and then um, even over in Ireland I, so I just started to fist pump people and um, so I went over to Ireland, and of course, I was ministering to the Huskers in the day they played Northwestern in Dublin. And of course, I don't know why I did it. I, so they all kind of lined up at the end to shake your hand. And those big footballers, every one of them, just had a big crunch and handshake. And I'm like, ah, ah, ah. And I come back, and my hand was even sore when I arrived back from Ireland than whenever I went there. Well, anyway... I was prayed for, but do you know, I, I, sometimes we, we get prayed for because it's the thing to do. Would you agree? And I don't think I was even expecting the Lord to heal me. I was like, it's just one of them things. I just have to put up with it, you know. And then Ron approached me on a Tuesday night, I think it was, and he says, is your hand not healed? And, you know, I went to shake his hand and I said, I went and I guess he said, is your hand not healed yet? Like he was in shock. And um, I sheepishly said, uh, no. <laughs> and then, because he was expecting my hand to be healed because he had been praying for me. And after it, I kind of I, I kind of meditated upon it and I'm like, am I really believing the Lord to heal me? Because Ron was like so like shocked that the Lord hadn't healed me. And I just, something within my spirit just said, I believe. Do you know, I woke up the next day and the pain was completely gone. Completely gone. So much so that I had to stretch my fingers to make sure that it, there was like something there where I could identify and I could vaguely just feel. And, but ever since that moment, it's been gone. And I'm just telling you that to tell you as a pastor, there's times that I'm challenged over the simple basics of the Christian life. That there's none of us can just be complacent and say, oh, because sometimes we just get into the way of, well, I'll go and get prayed for, but I don't believe, I don't expect God to really heal me. As long as we are in these mortal bodies, we are all susceptible to sickness. Would you agree? As sure as you are on this earth, and as sure as you're in this corruptible body, and as sure as you are surrounded by fallen creatures, you are also susceptible to all types of hurt, wounds, and injury. Would you agree? Uh, if any of you play sports, hello. Amen? But some of the deepest and most painful injuries, sickness, and wounds that we will receive are not physical, but mental emotional and spiritual are you with me we all at school heard sticks and stones will break my bones but names will never hurt me that's all load of baloney amen 
Step out to make a difference for the Lord and you will definitely become the target of the devil. And his aim is to hurt you. His aim is actually to injure you. His aim is to wound you and take you out of the battle. He wants you to be a victim. Now I'm sure you would agree with me, but as human beings we are complicated. Would you agree? We're very complicated. Uh, we don't even understand ourselves. Every time you think you've got yourself sussed out, um, you suddenly get a shock. Where did that come from? Why did I think that? Why did I feel that? Why did I not just keep my mouth shut? Have you ever been there? I've been convinced for years that if the enemy hits you in one area, it also affects you in other areas of your life. Now let me explain. We are tripart beings. We are physical, mental and emotional, and also spiritual. Would you agree? Well, we need to be aware of that because if the enemy hits you on one, it normally affects the other. And sometimes we're in ignorance. Well, why am I feeling this whenever I'm going through this? Um, some Christians are physically sick today. They're battling with illness. They're battling with disease. Some Christians are emotionally broken. Their hearts are broken in two. They could be dealing with bereavement. They could be dealing with a breakup in a relationship. They could be dealing with betrayal. They could be dealing with a loss of a job. They could be dealing with the burden of an empty nest after the chicks have flown away. They could be wounded by a spouse. They could be wounded by a friend. They could be wounded by a brother or sister in the Lord. They could be wounded by an enemy. Some Christians need healing from mental overload because the pressures of life have just become too much. Uh, they've just, they're overwhelmed. Some Christians need healing from traumatic, physical, emotional, or mental experiences. Some Christians need healing from physical, psychological, or sexual abuse. Would you agree with me? There's all types of injury. There's all types of wounds. Regardless of what you're going through, the Lord is here to meet your need and heal every single one of us this morning. Amen? Amen. One thing that we need to realize is this. Regardless of what you're going through, or having to endure. The expectation for every believer is to take God at his word, to receive the benefits that come with being a child of God. If you refuse to receive God's healing, then you're choosing to be a victim. Healing is a central reality in scripture for God's people. Now, I want you to stick with me here in case you think I'm a heretic or something like this. Because the Word of God is what's going to speak this morning. The fact is we all need some form of healing. It is inevitable that you will be wounded and you will require healing. Verse 22 of our main reading this morning tells us that God's words are health to God's people. Health. This word health literally means a proper cure, a medicine, or a healing remedy. That is what scripture is. There is nothing like the word of God. It doesn't matter where you are this morning spiritually. It doesn't matter what you're going through. The word of God has got something fresh Something specific and applicable to minister into your situation right now. The question that I pondered over yesterday as I was preparing this message was this. Why does God heal? Why does God heal? And I believe that he gave me three answers. And I want to really just share with you this morning these three things. In regard to healing. Why does God heal? Number one. 
This is who he is, and this is what he does. Number two, he cares for our needs. Number three, it is a fulfillment of the inspired scriptures. Let's look at number one. God heals because this is who he is, and this is what he does. God spoke to Israel through its leader Moses back in the day, many thousands of years ago, in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. And this is what he said. If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Brother, sister, this is our God. Has he changed? The last line here confirms that God is Yahweh Rapha, or Jehovah Rapha, or the Lord, our healer. That's who God is. That's who our God is this morning. When you get a revelation of a title or description like this, you realize this is who he is. I will go further. This is who he is, and this is what he does for his children. God is known by many names in the Bible, but each name reveals a certain attribute of his divine character. These names are important. Please don't overlook or dismiss the names of God. Yahweh Rapha is just one of many names found in Scripture that describes who God is and what he does. This title means the God who heals. And in fact, what he actually said is stronger than that. He basically said, healing, healing is what I am. That's what it means. Healing is what I am. He's our great physician this morning. Psalm 147, 3 says, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. I love what Christian writer David Clarkson says. The titles of God are virtually promises. When you read a title like that, you can honestly see that title as a promise. Yes. I take a hold of him. When you take a hold of him, you take a hold of the promise. Now, contrary to what many people think, healing wasn't just for the New Testament. A lot of people say, well, Jesus come and he was healing people. And, this is, and he, he gives us the responsibility to pray for the sick. And that's a New Testament thing. Can I tell you, healing has always come with the people of God in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Um, Exodus 23, 24. This is God speaking again through Moses. Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them and, and quite break down their images. And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. Is that lovely? He said to the people of God, I will take sickness away from your presence. But there were conditions for that. Do you understand? He said, you follow me, I'm going to look after you. You don't follow me, then you're going to receive the plagues that Egypt or the world is experiencing. Basically he's saying, if you will turn from your sins, if you'll bow the knee to me, I'm going to heal. By the way, you can't play games with God. Um, we either take him at his word or we don't. It, it's just as simple as that. And by the way, he knows whether there's compromise in your life or whether there's not. Psalm 103 verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Listen this, and put your seatbelts on. 
who forgiveth all thine iniquities. And we all say, Amen. who healeth all thy diseases. Amen. Sometimes we can grasp it. Oh, he takes away all my sins. Amen. And then he goes on in the same verse to say, who healeth all thy diseases. And we're like, oh, not sure about that one. That's like, I think, Lord's kind of, that's a big speak. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he takes away all your sins and iniquities? Do you believe that he takes away all your diseases? Can he lie to you? No. Okay. David here outlines two mighty things that God does for his children. He forgives and he heals. Is that not incredible? Mm-hmm. Not not incredible news for us this morning? Mm-hmm. This righteous God that we serve does it all. Do you believe that? Do you receive that? Yeah. Or do we have to be all politically correct today and qualified? But, you know, the only qualifications that we need to put upon this is the qualifications that God puts upon it. Mm-hmm. Well, I know somebody, listen, I get it. We can all give examples of examples of examples, but I'm here just to bring to you what God has given to me. So, we see the heartbeat of God whenever we come into the New Testament because Jesus is the ultimate physical expression of the invisible God. You get into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you follow the life of Jesus. Everywhere he goes, there's three things that mark his ministry. Do you know what they are? Saving souls, healing the sick, and delivering those that are oppressed or or possessed. Do a study. I've done a study many years ago. In fact, probably 30 years ago. I just, what marked Jesus' ministry? And I had a a page and it's like, these things keep coming up every single passage, time after time. I'm here to tell you Jesus is a healer. Everywhere he went, he brought healing. By the way, he's here this morning. And if he's here this morning, he brings healing this morning to this congregation. As needy humans encountered Jesus and trusted in him, the Bible says time after time after time, he made them whole. That's what it says. I know in the King James it says he made them whole. I'm not sure about the other translations. You find that phrase throughout the New Testament. Do you know that everyone, and I want you to hear me, everyone that Jesus touched was made whole? Do you realize that? He touched the lady with a fever and it immediately lifted. He touched the blind eyes and they immediately saw. He touched a dumb tongue, it immediately spoke. He touched a leper and the leprosy immediately departed. He touched a coffin With a young man who was dead in the coffin. The young man got out of the coffin. Amen? Amen. Whoever he touched were healed. It's the same today. Jesus has not changed. Amen? Amen? But you need to let him touch you this morning. You need to be open to his touch. You need to want his touch this morning. You need to have faith that his touch is enough. But I, I want to come out with a big speak and you really need to come close for what I'm about to say because if you miss this, you're going to miss a nugget, a really big nugget this morning. It was not just those who Jesus touched that were healed. It was also those who touched Jesus that were healed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brother, sister, I didn't realize that to yesterday. And I'm talking to you as a pastor who has read through the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation quite a number of times. I just keep, that's my studies for 30 years. I just keep reading through, reading through, reading through, year after year. But I did not realize that. Now, I know people who touched him. The woman who touched the hem of his garment was made whole. But 
I didn't realize everyone that touched him was healed. And I'm going to give you scripture to support that. Would you turn with me to Mark chapter 6, verse 56? Because it's so important not just to make a big speak, but also to actually prove what the Word of God actually says. Amen? Amen. You know, I've heard so much over the years from preachers, and they say something, and it's like, why are they not supporting that with Scripture? Especially when it comes to end times, but I don't want to get sidetracked. <laughs> Seriously, you, you hear all types of speaks, and I'm like, um, where's that in the Bible? Is that not a fair question? And they're like, they start to speak in Swahili, and it's like, I don't even understand what they're saying. I need to call Peter here to help me. <laughs> and Barbara. <laughs> okay, now listen to this, because this is the Word of God. Mark 6, 56. And wherever he, enter, wherever he entered into villages or cities or country, they led the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. Isn't that potent? It wasn't just who he touched, but it was everyone who touched him was made whole. Amen? Amen. This is the moment where I do a Jericho march, okay? <laughs> okay? Seriously, this is dancing ground this morning. I seen Michael Brown dancing at the back this morning. Why? Because the Lord had touched him or he had touched the Lord. I'm telling you, you see when revival comes and you see somebody been set free from demon possession or somebody set free from drugs and they go on a little dance, don't, you, don't let a religious spirit rise up within you and go, oh, that's ridiculous in the presence of the Lord. <laughs> Seriously, I'm telling you, the religious people will leave church when revival hits yeah. because they're going, oh, it's not terrible in the presence of the Lord. I'm telling you, when you get set free, I'll tell you... That you you want to just run. Amen. I was in a meeting. Brother Clendenin was preaching in California. And I was in a meeting. <laughs> and honestly, the, it was a powerful meeting. And it come to the end and the Holy Ghost was really moving. And honestly, this ginormous church, this guy was, this guy was sprinting right around the whole, he just kept doing laps around. And Brother Clendenin was sitting on the altar. <laughs> and he was just sitting there. And every time, oh, <laughs> Oh, I just uh, squashed our <laughs> tissues there. Every time he come around, Brother Clinton would go. Like this here. And I'm, I'm just laughing. I'm like, this is, this is happening in church. <laughs> I know the religious people are going to feel mega awkward here. And I knew this guy, whoever he was, he had got a mighty touch. I didn't know who, what, why, when, where, but I knew he wasn't. He wasn't playing. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize until after that guy had been locked up in prison for like 25 years. Yesterday, he had just got out of prison and he had just got wonderfully saved. Now, I'm telling you, that guy was free. Yeah. And God had touched him. God had healed his heart. God had set that man free. And I'm telling you what, he had every right to want to do that. But I'm just, I'm preparing you for when we get into this new building. If you see that, don't let a religious spirit come up and then go home and critique it over the lunch table. I don't know whether that's what Jesus would have allowed. I'm telling you what, when Jesus touched people in the, they were skipping, dancing, rejoicing. I'm telling you what, they, they were set free. Imagine your whole life been blind and one touch from this man and suddenly you can actually see. Perfect vision. Huh? Are they just going to go, um, oh, thank you, Lord. P appreciate that. Pre appreciate. Is that what they're going to do? Huh? They're going to be hugging on him. They're going to be kissing on him like Michael Brown wanted to do to that girl when he got the report. I mean, seriously. Amen? Amen. I'm just telling you, these things are real. Jesus is real and he works. And those that not only he touched, but those that touched him, they were made whole. 
So how does one become healed, preacher? Well, here's three things. Run to Jesus, our healer. Take a hold of his promises and touch the hem of his garment this morning. You have the right to reach out this morning by faith and touch the hem of his garment and say, Heal me, Lord. It's not an A to Z. I'm telling you, we want to complicate it. When Ron, Ron's response challenged me, and by faith, I just took a hold. I said, he is a healer. I receive it. And I'm telling you, I know and God knows something happened. And that, things like that have happened to me time after time. And it's like, it's so important that we testify to the power of God. I'm here to tell you he's a healer. Over the years, I've heard many say and pray that healing is the children's bread. Has anybody ever heard that statement? Anybody ever heard it? Healing is the children's bread. Okay, I've heard it a lot. And you hear it a lot in Pentecostal circles. And I have included it in my sermon title this morning. So that means I'm going to have to prove it. Amen? Amen. But the question is, is it a religious cliche or is it a biblical truth? Where does it say that in the Bible? Well, it's actually a paraphrase of what actually happened when Jesus encountered a Gentile woman in Matthew 15, verse 26. I just want to read just the story so we, we get a perspective of what was happening here. Matthew 15, and we'll start at verse 22 for the sake of time. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thy son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now remember, this woman's a foreigner. She's a Gentile. Then came she and worshipped him and said, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Wow. You'd think that she would... like She's been called a dog here. Back in the day... Gentiles were considered dogs. This is, this is Jesus talking. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Okay, now please know this. Jesus was not being mean here. Okay? What he was outlining was, first of all, his prime calling was to Israel. He had come first to bring the gospel to Israel, and then, after Israel had received the message, the message then was going out to the Gentiles. Okay? So the Gentiles, after Pentecost, we're about to receive this wonderful gospel. But before time, this woman comes on the scene, a Gentile woman. Now, I want you to realize that this conversation was between Jesus and an unsaved Gentile woman at this juncture. Okay, so it starts off, she's not saved. She's not a believer. She's a Gentile. And that day, she's a dog. Um, he told her he couldn't give the, the children's bread or healing to dogs because she was not his. This woman was essentially trying to take a hold of covenantal benefits that were not hers. Are you with me? Now please stick with me. Let me illustrate it, okay? It's a bit like this. It's like another woman coming up to me and calling me her husband in order to benefit from my health insurance. 
even though we're not married. Okay, does that make sense? She can say all she wants that she's my wife, but she's not my wife. Okay? This is what was happening here. But these straight comments from Jesus did not deter the woman. She was determined to receive a miracle on behalf of her daughter from the Lord. She clearly knew that Jesus was the only answer to her need. And to her daughter's need, by the way. That is why she was so persistent. Jesus recognized her faith and responded accordingly by saving her soul and then healing her daughter. Isn't that wonderful? This was not bogus faith. Be assured, Jesus will only respond to genuine faith. Jesus is essentially saying here that healing is the believer's portion. It is their inheritance. Brother, sister, it's the believer's inheritance. Do you think I'm some crazy charismatic this morning? Seriously. I mean, do you think I've lost it? Brother, sister, I have a responsibility to bring to you the word of God. I am given to you what he gave to me yesterday. God is wanting us to receive the revelation of this, that healing is indeed the children's bread today. Healing is for us. If you do not believe this, then how can you take a hold of this? You're just as bad as a lot of other Christians who do not believe that healing is for today. Oh, once the canon of Scripture was completed, that was gone. That was for then, this is for now. No. I don't think so. What they're actually confessing is that God has changed. They're declaring that His promises are no longer applicable to us today. That is nonsense. Okay, this brings us to the second point. God heals because He cares for our needs. The overriding motive of God to heal a person is because He cares for His children. Michael, He cares for us. He cares for you and He cares for me. Healing in the ministry of Christ was not merely to prove that He was God. Healing in the ministry of the New Testament church wasn't just to prove that they were anointed of God. Healing was firstly a manifestation of his character, then a manifestation of his divine love, and then a fulfillment of divine truth. Let us remind ourselves of the, the approach of Christ in Scripture. Matthew 14, 14 says this, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Can you see that? Um, I, could, I could quote quite a number of passages this morning in the New Testament where Jesus comes on the scene and it says he had compassion. He had compassion. That tells me he cares. He sees somebody blind or wounded or whatever it is, somebody bereaved, and his heart is full of compassion. Brother, sister, whatever you're going through this morning, he cares. He has compassion upon you because that's who he is. Je Jesus genuinely cared for the people. His heart is toward hurting people. It is important that you see Jesus as this in your life because it is here that you should find comfort, you should find hope, and that should result in you finding faith. The Lord's heart is toward his children. God is not detached from us. He's not unconcerned by our welfare. He is hands-on in dealing with us. But let me tell you something. We need to let him heal us. We need to let him. Even when we take a wrong turn or make a foolish choice, he's always there. I'm telling you the God that we serve has told us that he's never going to leave us and he's never going to forsake us. We either believe it or we deny it. But not only that, 
but he also has his eye upon us. He's got his eye on the sparrow, but he's got his eye upon his people. He's looking out for us. He's watching out. When we are heartbroken, he is feeling that. It says he's not untouched by the feelings of our infirmities, but is in all, was in all ways tempted or tested or tried like we are, yet without sin. There's a verse in Lamentations 3, verse 22, 23 says this, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Can I read that again? Maybe I'm just getting excited this morning, but it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Isn't that lovely? Like you could, you could survive on that passage for this next month. Just waking up every morning and realize his compassion is new this morning. That's what it says. First of all, his compassion feels not. Number two, they're fresh and new every morning. He's there. Whenever you get up and you've got a sore head or you've got Monday blues or whatever it is, he's there. He feels your pain. If you're carrying a heavy burden this morning, if you're broken hearted this morning, if you are hurting this morning, if you're wounded, if you're at your wit's end, you can hand it over to him and he can heal you. But the source of our confidence is in his compassionate character. Isn't it lovely to know that he cares? I, I'm telling you, I have a big major difficulty with the God that a lot of people portray out there. This God with a big stick. It is a misrepresentation of God. And I urge you to, to fight that. When people misrepresent this God and have him as a big stick with, ready to throw people out of the house, challenge it. Because it's not the God, it's not the revelation of God in this book. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I, I no longer tiptoe around it, by the way. It's not a matter of, oh, religious pride or theological pride. It's like, who actually is our God? Is he who he says he is? Or is he this other God that the legalists try and present? Or the easy believism crowd try and present? Both are wrong. Our third and final point is this. God heals because it is a fulfillment of the inspired scriptures. Listen to what it says in Matthew 8, verses 16 and 17. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. All that were sick. All that were sick. Do you know what that phrase means in the original Greek? All that were sick. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness, sicknesses. He fulfilled scripture. The healing ministry of Jesus was the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy in Isaiah 53 that pointed to the event, the meaning, and the fruit of the cross. This is what it says in Isaiah 53, 4. Surely... He hath borne our griefs. If you're going through bereavement this morning, He has borne your grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes we're healed. We're healed. I'm here to tell you this morning, despite what many evangelicals say, Jesus is still a healer and there is healing in the atonement. I know a strong fundamentalist preacher in Northern Ireland who argued for years that there's no healing in the atonement. 
He just argued the classic fundamentalist line. That was back for them. I have a friend who's full-time in the Lord's work, and he was back and forth with him on this, just trying to get to the bottom of it. The guy started to research passages like this and, and looking into the Hebrew, looking into the Greek. And he ended up admitting there is healing in the atonement. Brother, sister, we can't fight the word of God. Okay? We know that in the atonement, he died for our sins. Amen? But he also died for our sicknesses. He took that upon himself. Now, we either say, well, yes, maybe, and and then question it. Or we just say, I believe. I believe it. And then I receive it. And I become it. The Hebrew word for healing here in Isaiah 53 is rapha, means to mend by stitching, to cure, to repair, or to make whole. So, I don't know what you're going through this morning. You may be physically in good health. But you could be emotionally, your heart could be ripped in two. Mentally, you could be ripped in two. Spiritually, you could be severely wounded. It could be something that happened to you recently. It could be something in the distant past that has never been healed. It could be something done by a family member. It could be something done by a friend. It could be something done by an enemy. But it still affects who you are and how you function. Listen, brother, sister, the obligation upon you today is to receive his healing. It's an obligation. We're Christians. That's our ben- That comes with the benefits of being a Christian. It's the children's bread. Are you willing to partake of this and let the Lord heal whatever needs healed? A lot of times we say, well, I don't need healing. I've got all my ducks in a row. I'm fine. The bottom line is we are all susceptible in this life to injury. And I am of the very strong belief that most wounds that we have are not physical. Somebody said something 27 years ago, and we think that it's gone until suddenly you meet them in Walmart. It's like, wow, wow. Then your back gets up, and you're like, if they come near me, I'm just going to tell them exactly what to think. Huh? You think you've got over it, but all you've done is buried it. You've never received full healing for it. And God has a habit of whenever you think you've got over something, he'll just create a situation that's like, boom. Oh, dear me. Why am I feeling that? Another example, just to back up my final point, is this. When Jesus began his earthly ministry and preached his first sermon, he spoke from Isaiah 61. Now, we all know it. We're probably most of us familiar with it. Um, embodied within that text is a revelation of the assignment he came to fulfill. And that includes binding up the brokenhearted. Let me quote it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Isaiah 61.1 The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison. To them that are bound. Now, it's interesting that this phrase bind up, it literally means to bandage up. He's come to bandage us up. Literally. You know what it's like when you have a wound? Like they, they bring the wound together, they stitch it together, and then they bandage it up. Okay? There's other times. They don't even put a stitch on it. You see guys playing soccer there and they've got blood all over them. And they, what they do is they bring them to the line, they just bandage them up and they send them out again. <laughs> they don't worry about all the concussion stuff or whatever. But the blood's all over their face, but they've got a bandage and then the bandage kind of changes color really quick. It just becomes red. Okay? But I'm telling you that he come to bandage us up. 
That's what he came to do. That's what that literally means in the original. And he come to do that because obviously that's something that human beings need. We need bandaged up. We are all susceptible to be injured. Isn't it lovely to have a great physician? We appreciate a good doctor, okay? I'm not in any way uh, trying to put a question mark over doctors or nurses or, you know, hospitals, whatever. I'm not saying I agree with everything they do, but I'm just saying... Thank God that we do have doctors in a civilized society. But we have someone that's greater than the best doctor in America. We've got the great physician. And if that's all you have, if they take all your rights off you in the last days, if they say to you that you're losing all your health benefits because you're a believer and you're not going to get this and that, you can say, well, I've got Jesus. I've got the best health benefits that a human being can ever have. Amen? Amen. So they can take it all off us. And it may well happen. I'm not being doom and gloom. But I'm telling you, there's benefits that come with being a child of God. And they're better than what the government can give us. Obamacare or any of that stuff, this is the best benefit care. Amen? Amen. By the way, they didn't give it to you. And guess what? They're never going to take it off you. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen? It's time for us to go to war. It's time for us to be real and realize who is for us, what is for us. And when I say go to war, I'm talking about spiritual warfare. Okay? The one thing the devil cannot deal with is the word of God. They can threaten you. They say, we're going to take everything off you. You can say, well, you know what? The greatest thing that I have, you can't take it off me. It's Jesus. You can can take my life, but the one thing you can't do is take Jesus from me. Because he said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end. Did he say that or did he say that? Okay, as I close, I want to just share this. You talk to preachers. Um, Over the years, they'll share different stories in regard to this subject. Um... There's times many have come, they're suffering from physical ailments. It could be emotional, mental, physical. And sometimes they're refusing to heal, which is hard. It's hard as a pastor to minister onto somebody, but you know they're not receiving it. They, they want to hold on to what they have. They, they've, they've had that wound for so long, nobody is going to take that wound off them because they've just become familiar with it. And if you try to go anywhere near it, there's a reaction. Um, The problem is they're refusing to accept God for who he is, number one. Number two, they're refusing to take God at his word. Number three, they're refusing to receive what is their inheritance. There's nothing you can do with somebody who doesn't want to be healed. There's nothing. There's no words that are greater than his words. So I'm here to tell you that the other thing is, and you, if you want your healing, make sure that before God, there's nothing between you and God. I mean, I literally mean that. I, I, know, um, I know of a situation where my friend Davy was at the front praying for the sick. And a man come up and he, he had been sick for quite a while. He was really, really ill. And he says, I, I need a miracle. And the Holy Ghost showed the man of God at the front exactly what he was dealing with. He said, if you go home and you remove the pornography from under your bed, you will be healed. Guess what? He did it and he was healed. True story. I'm telling you, if the Holy Ghost moving, we don't play games on this subject. Amen? So I, you've seen what he said to the children of Israel. If you remove all the idols, if you remove this... You bow the knee to me, then you'll get your healing. So it's not just that he says, oh, you can live how you want to live and you can just get all the benefits. No. If you want to function on this subject, remove the junk. I'm going to finish with just a hymn. I'm not going to sing it, by the way, so you can relax. 
He healeth me, O blessed truth. His mighty word renews my youth. By his own power from sickness free, my precious Saviour healeth me. He healeth me, he healeth me. By his own word he healeth me. His faithful witness I would be, for by his word he healeth me. Sometimes through testing times I go, dark seems the way, and full of woe. But in the furnace, though I be, my great physician healeth me. Lord, I would spread this truth abroad, the mighty power of thy word. It's just the same the blind now see, and demons at thy presence flee. For sin and sickness doth depart when thou dost reign within my heart. And I from all the curse am free, since Christ my Saviour healeth me. Isn't that beautiful? Let's pray.